This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Tuesday morning. Uh, we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. And uh, I'm Prashant with me. My colleague Nigel here is... Uh, in the studios, Nigel. Hi, morning. Morning. Uh, Sonia is, of course, joining us from uh, Bangalore. Sonia, morning. Hi, Nigel. Hi, Prashant. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the markets, it's been very, very range-bound, right? Not too much happening. And uh, I guess that recent high that we saw, 19,500, is becoming a little bit of a sticky zone for the market now, Prashant. It seems to be, uh, Sonia. And, uh, you know, let's actually kick off on that exact point, uh, what you made. Uh, so, you know, yesterday, the Nifty basically got to the near-term resistance level, which is 19,400. Uh, now, that is nothing but the uh, point where the Nifty meets the nearest, smallest trend line, falling trend line. We put this level out in the morning yesterday. So we'll be close just seven points short of it. Intraday, I mean, there was uh, a breach of the 19,400 level twice. Uh, so, intraday, it looked good. It cleared, but closed. It fell short by just a little bit. But... You basically practically close there, which is great news, right? I mean, it's not a bad way to start a Monday, start a new week after the last few days, which looked very, very iffy. That's point number one. I'll circle back to levels in just a bit. Just take a quick look at what the global setup uh, looks like. Uh, equities rallied. So you had the US uh, S&P, which was up about 0.6. The Nasdaq was up even better with a one and a half odd percent plus kind of gain. Uh, but along with equities, what also rallied were Treasury yields. Now, this has been the big story that we pointed out. Yesterday, for example, same time we asked the question, the market seems to be hunting for what is the neutral rate, the rate at which the Fed will no longer have to do more or cut uh, and, you know, kind of leave rates at that particular level. What is that level? That seems to be the confusion the market seems to have. So if you look at what happened, the two-year is now at 5%. These are all nominal values. The 10-year jumped nine basis points to 4.3%. This is the highest since late 2022. That's the, that's the uh, on the 10-year. I mean, actually, you look, look at longer maturities like 30-year, they're also hitting records now. Uh, the question is only this, rising yields also signal growth, which is good, right? But, at, uh, but this is also what you describe as the risk-free rate. So at this rate, can, uh, uh, you know, can, can things function well, especially risky assets like, uh, you know, equities function well? That's the only question. I reckon that we are in a bit of a transition period. I mean, the market is adjusting from, you know, what it thought it will get, which is a soft landing, to maybe something else. We will find out. Uh, and to that end, the Jackson Hole uh, sort of meeting, which kicks off this week, is going to be important in kind of setting that context. So the primary risk now becomes that uh, the market interprets what comes out of Jackson Hole in a hawkish way. And looking at the Treasury market uh, reaction, the bar for a hawkish surprise seems to be lower, not higher. Uh, you know, you have the Fed Chair Powell, who will speak on Friday. And I think if he does indicate that maybe the neutral rate where they will feel comfortable leaving rates at for a while is higher, I mean, I think the market perhaps is already there. It's kind of, you know, adjusting itself in anticipation of it. Or maybe we see a little bit more. Uh, so that's the global uh, context. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of whether, in what shape or form will growth have to be slowed down for inflation to be brought under control. That's as simple as that. Now, let's just get back to the Nifty. It, as I said, 19,400 is the first level. It needs to keep its head above the 19,400 level, point number one. The next hurdle on the Nifty is the 20-day moving average, uh, which uh, is at 19,554. So once, I mean, you cross this, another 150 points, you're at the 20-day moving average, which is, I mean, of course, well discussed. On the way down, the low of 19,253 should not be broken. Uh, so that's basically the low from last week, uh, which the market uh, got to. Now, Bank Nifty, <coughs> you know, uh, broke and uh, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's looks, it looks like, I mean, yesterday was a decent kind of price action. We ended about a third of a percent uh, higher. But closing above 44,100 on the Bank Nifty, which is another 100 points from here, will indicate that perhaps the pullback, which is the short-term correction that we have been seeing, is complete. But that is only the first marker. But you need markers when you are undergoing a short-term correction and an otherwise uptrend. On the downside for the Nifty Bank, the level to watch is 43,600. And that is the important level which the Bank Nifty better defend if selling were to start to emerge. Uh, as I said... 
I mean, you know, uh, it's a bit of a range right now with no clear direction. Yesterday, we had a similar kind of implied open from the gift nifty, but the market picked up and ended up in a very smart way. So maybe we see, you know, some uh, a semblance of what we saw yesterday, today as well. After all, it's not as if, uh, you know, there is a growth problem, right? Not just not here in India or the big market in the U.S., uh, but it's just, I mean, that perhaps in the U.S. especially, there is a little too much growth for markets liking. But that's not a, a terrible problem to have. It's a problem which needs a solution, but uh, that is what it is. Uh, Sonia, so I mean, it's an interesting setup as we begin this Tuesday. I think it's a great problem to have, right? Too much growth. I mean, of course, uh, from an interest rate standpoint, uh, things are different, but growth is always a good thing. And the benchmark of every uh, bull market is based on growth, earnings growth, corporate growth, etc. So uh, having said that, Prashant, I mean, as you rightly said, you know, this is a market that's so range bound. But within that, there are pockets that are doing well, pockets that are uh, seeing profit taking. So that's important to point out. So while the Nifty is within this band of 19,200 to 19,500, this month, IT, for example, has done very well, whether it's Tech Mahindra, HCL Tech Infosys, all up about 3 to 10 percent this month. And on the flip side, auto stocks are coming off a little bit. So this month, autos have been the biggest loser. So within this range as well, there's lots happening in individual names. Uh, the recent high of 19,480, it's a bit of a sticky zone on the upside. And there seems to be no major trigger on the horizon which can take the markets above that level. So in that context, perhaps this range is something that we'll have to reckon with. As you said, multi-year high for the U.S. 10-year yield, 4.34% now. And I think this is the highest level that we've seen since way back in, uh, you know, 2007. And that has led to, because of the higher U.S. yields, that's put pressure on a lot of commodities, whether it's gold prices, which are at a five-month low, silver prices as well. Brent is back at $84 a barrel. So important to, uh, you know, put that into context. There was a large FII sell figure yesterday, the, despite the market holding on to that 19,300 mark. The FIS sold 1,900 crores in the cash markets, while domestic institutions bought about 620-odd crores. And a couple of data points that I'm watching out for from the global arena. One of them is the Fed non-manufacturing survey. There's the U.S. existing home sales data that comes out today. And then, of course, there's Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech that uh, happens on Friday. Generally, it's not very market moving, especially here in India, but we track it nevertheless to get any cues on what the Fed might do going ahead. Uh, but Nigel, you know, as I was pointing out, uh, the market might be range bound, but within that, the constituents are very interesting, whether it's technology stocks that have come back in a big way or even, you know, autos that have started to cool off a bit. Well, so now you just take a look at the mid-cap index. The mid-cap index on a day-to-day -day basis, you're finding stocks that are moving up 5 to 10% in a single trading session. So that's really where the big action is. Even yesterday, the mid-cap index was quite strong, ended higher with a solid gain. But yesterday, we made this point, right, that it's a bit of a scalper's market. What is that? You buy the intraday dip, but you don't carry the position. Now, if you did that yesterday, you didn't miss out anything today. Because for starters, we're likely to be more or less flattish. In fact, we came off a little bit from the day's high. So the Nifty is still in this 400-point range odd. But the Nifty Bank, that holds the key, and that will give direction. Either it goes ahead and revisits the 43,600-odd mark, which we touched last week, or it starts moving towards 44,700-odd. We'll get to those levels and why I'm talking about those levels in just a bit. Yesterday, there was clearly some kind of unwinding of uh, positions, and it appears at least from the FIs, there was some kind of short covering on the Nifty Bank. And that's been the weaker index. So there were first signs of some short covering on the index futures on the whole. Well, they continue to remain net short with close around 57% of their positions on the short side. What's heartening from uh, the FNO perspective from the FIs? Well, it's the way they wrote puts yesterday. Close around 2 lakh puts were written. More than 2 puts were written for every one call. So that's giving you a sense. Maybe in the near term, the bulls believe the lower levels can get defended, at least going by the options data. Two strikes I'm pulling up. The, on the uh, Nifty, that's a 19,350 put, 19,500 call. And both of them, you just take the premiums and you fit it into the levels that we're looking at and it fits in perfectly. On the Nifty, the 19,550-odd mark, that's a 20-year DMA. So that becomes a bit of a resistance zone and we'll be in this band till we decisively cross that. On the downside, well, the 50 DMA comes in closer to around 19,300. But as we have seen over the last few days, 19,200, 19,250, it seems, as of now, positioning as such that we don't break that level on the downside. But the Nifty Bank, there appears there was some writing even at those strikes, 44,000 put, 43,900 put. So getting straight to the levels then, just going by that put writing that we've seen, 
The 100 DMA is at around the 43,740 uh, and, and odd. So this support actually is at around 43,600 because we tested that last week. On the upside, 44,200 becomes a resistance, first level of resistance. The 44,000 call has the highest amount of open interest. So I'm just plugging in the premium out there. And the second resistance comes in at around that 44,700 odd crucial technical level. Since it's the Nifty Financial Services Index expiry, the weekly expiry, just we'll put that band as well up for you. The gift Nifty is suggesting a flattish start, but I think you stick to the trend. If you get a big intraday dip, maybe you look to buy that and you square off your position without carrying it uh, to the next day. But we are still pretty much in a consolidation mode. Okay, well, uh, lots to focus on in the next two and a half hours. So let's get started very quickly. We have some commentary first up coming in from Vikas Jain of CLSA. He's quite bullish on the Indian markets. He says that consensus upgraded its nifty FY2425 EPS by 0.6 to 1%. Uh, okay, but they are actually 3 to 5% below consensus. He says despite a greater number of stocks seeing earnings upgrades than cuts, CLSA analysts have cut their recommendations for a far larger 14 stocks versus upgrades for only two suggesting discomfort with valuations. The impa impact of the sharp increase in inflation on rural demand will need to be closely monitored, he says. Okay, we've got uh, Venugopal Gare of Bernstein who says that India is at a crucial juncture regarding the state of the economic cycle. He says good policy and strong execution will give India a significant economic opportunity. Uh, he adds, while it's still early days, their engagement with key policymakers suggests a similar perspective, suggesting that India's story is being approached in a more organized fashion at the highest levels of the government. He remains optimistic about India's long-term prospects. All right, let's also get you some money market views for today. Abhishek Goenka of IFA Global says... The recent weakness in the rupee can mostly be attributed to the sell-off in the Chinese yuan. However, he says the RBI has so far managed to prevent the rupee from hitting new all-time lows against the dollar in onshore spot. He says domestic July CPI overshoot, higher crude prices and higher US Treasury yields too are contributing to the rupee weakness. He expects the RBI to continue to step in to curb volatility and revises their medium-term range to 82.4 to 83.70 to the dollar. On bonds, we have Ajay uh, Magnolia of JM Financial who says that global yields remain elevated as fear of higher for longer policy rates in major economies continues as they display resilient economic data. He says domestic yields may take cues from U.S. Treasuries, crude prices, U.S. PMI data as well as Fed Chair Powell's speech later this week. With no domestic cues, he is expecting the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in a range of between 7.2 to 7.26 percent for the day. Well, we have a lot of stock-specific action that we're going to be tracking for you. We get to that in a bit. But for the time being, we run you through what we're focusing on in our top 10 segment. We're looking at Union Bank, Sri Ram Properties, Glenmark Pharma, l &T Tech, Brigade Enterprises, Adani Enterprises, REITs, uh, Ramkrishna Forgings, as well as Lemon Tree. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow. We're expecting a large trade on SJS, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Likely to open up in the red. Okay, Gary Schlossberg is a global strategist at Wells Fargo Investment Institute. He's joining us now uh, on the program. Gary, good to have you with us here on CNBC TV 18 as always. Uh, so the two years at 5%, the 10 year is uh, at about what, four, almost 4.35. Uh, you know, what's, uh, what should we expect uh, for uh, equities? Uh, by the way, equities ended high overnight, right? And then later in the week, we have, uh, we'll hear from uh, Chair, Fed Chair Powell. Uh, so, what's uh, what's the likely roadmap from here, near near term? Well, we think the market is being challenged. There is some uncertainty about the outlook for interest rates. They have, as you pointed out, moved up currently at a 16-year high on that 10-year yield, and that uh, creates something of a headwind for stocks in two ways. First, the uh, valuations are compressed, and secondly, it could contribute to the slowdown in economic growth that we expect to see during the balance of the year, and that would, of course, affect earnings. Gary, hi, good morning, and thanks for joining us on the channel. I wanted your thoughts particularly on a market like India, because the going has been pretty strong so far, but now we're hitting a bit of a hurdle uh, due to perhaps lack of triggers on the upside. What do you do as a global strategist? Do you continue to bet on a market like India? 
Well, we would take a cautious view of India. It is certainly the star performer in Asia, one of the strongest performing economies, and that uh, bodes well. We are seeing some inflation pressures developing, which the Reserve Bank may have to deal with down the road, leaving India in much the same situation that the U.S. may find itself in right now. So I think caution is the order of the day. Uh, India's markets have had a good run, uh, but the outlook uh, is a bit clouded by that inflation outlook. Mm. Hi, Gary. Good morning. Uh, Gary, what about, uh, you know, the way the bond yields have been behaving? You know, unless we factoring in very, very great earnings growth from year on, which as of now, the global equities are not factoring in, particularly for developed markets, do you think uh, you can see high amount of allocation of money towards bonds in comparison to equities? Well, we think we uh, should be cautious on the bond market. We're currently advocating a barbell strategy, focusing on very short-term rates. We think there still could be one more rate increase by the Federal Reserve. Long-term yields, we think, are close to their peak, but there still is the potential for some additional upside there. Given the outlook for inflation, we could see it leveling out at a rate above the Fed's target. Uh, and uh, the market still seems to be pretty optimistic, not only on inflation, but more generally the outlook for longer term rates. We're still dealing with what's called a negative term premium, and that uh, could create some upside for yields down the road. Mm. Okay, uh, <clears throat> got that. Gary, uh, so if on, say, Friday, Fed Chair Powell kind of says, well, we're comfortable with, with where rates are, Will we see a knee-jerk sort of correction lower uh, in yields? And uh, what will that really mean? I mean, how will that be taken uh, the week after? I, th I think it will be taken well by the market if Powell uh, is conciliatory there. Our view is that it might be more of a hawkish uh, hold on policy, uh, pretty much hinting that the Fed won't be doing anything at the next meeting. But out beyond that, really contingent upon inflation, which by all accounts... Uh, may be leveling out, or certainly the progress toward that lower inflation rate could become more difficult. Okay. Uh, so what is your expectation now in terms of what your pecking order is uh, for the rest of the year, both with respect to emerging markets as well as developed markets? Do you believe that if their rates are going to perhaps move higher, if the U.S. markets do get into a recession, then maybe it's better off that, you know, people put their money in emerging markets, markets like India, compared to developed markets for the rest of the year? Well, we think emerging markets will be facing challenges from a slowing global economy. In fact, even as the U.S. economic growth slows, the situation in Europe and, of course, China, we think uh, will be lagging enough that the emerging markets could be facing challenges there. Uh, so uh, we'd still be cautious on emerging markets as the global economy goes through what we think will be a slowdown uh, before it emerges into a growth recovery during the latter part of 2024. Mm. Gary, final question before we let you go. Uh, sounding a little bit cautious uh, this morning, both on equities as well as bonds. So do you think at current reckoning, sitting on cash, I mean, will, will you all be uh, considering that as a bit of a position? Point number one. Point number two, just want to clear the air. The last time you joined us, you said maybe the Fed has a couple of more hikes in store, either one or two. You think they've got one more in store? We think that uh, we'll see, uh, probably see one more this year. We could see another one in the early part of 2024, although that does become problematic if the U.S. is going through an economic slowdown. As far as cash is concerned, we think it is part of that barbell strategy. If the Federal Reserve is raising short-term interest rates, uh, then money market rates, at least for now, benefit short-term, uh, very short-term bonds as well as part of that barbell strategy that also allocates toward the longer end of the market. All right, Gary, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your thoughts here on CNBC you. TV 18. That's the market experts saying that they are cautious on the Indian markets now. Uh, and that's pr primarily because of the run-up that the market has seen. So valuations are not very comfortable in a market like India. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, our entire team will be joining in to help us with the list of top 10 stocks that you need to watch out for today. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. So this market has been so very range bound, which gives us some time to ponder over individual stocks. Here's our entire team joining in to help us with that list. First up on our radar is Union Bank. Abhishek is here to tell us why he's watching that one. Abhishek, good morning. Good morning, Sonia. So, Union Bank of India has launched a QIP uh, that is up to rupees 5,000 crore. The base deal size is about 2,500 crore, and based on the demand, it can be scaled further by 2,500 crore. Indicative price is about 86.55 per share. Now, this uh, implied discount to uh, SEBI's uh, flow price is about 5%, and to NSE's uh, closing price is about 5.7%. Now, calculation shows that if at all they raise 5,000 crore completely, a net worth will increase by 6.15% to about 86,364 crores. Equity dilution is about 8-8.5% uh, eight, which means that the government of India's stake can come down to 77% from 83.5% that it is there right now. Uh, tier 1 ratio increases by 30 basis point to about 14.16%. However, book value declines by more than 2% to about 116.5 per share. Back to you. Thanks a lot for that, Abhishek. Well, let's hop across to Nimesh. She's here to tell us about an SGS uh, uh, Enterprises block deal that is expected and Sriram Properties uh, block that took place yesterday. Morning, Nimesh. You gave us a heads up about this one, the SGS uh, block. Tell us more. Hi, Nigel. So, 30% uh, uh, equity is going to change hands in SGS today uh, via block deal. So, the promoter entity, which is uh, Evergraph Holding, they are going to sell close to 29% stake and the key managerial personnel is going to sell, the, which is Sander Consulting, they are going to sell half a percent stake. Uh, the floor price indicated, uh, the indicated floor price is 580 rupees per share, which means a 6.5% discount to yesterday's closing price. Now, uh, after this block deal, Evergraph will, will be still holding 14 lakh shares, which they have a lock up till the 10th of November. But in a large block, nearly 30% equity is going to change hands uh, in SGS Enterprises via block deal today. So that's the first one. The second one is uh, Sh uh, Shriram Properties. Now, yesterday there was an interesting block. Omega Holding sold close to 18 lakh shares at an average price of 75 rupees. Now, there is a la large anticipation that there's going to be a large block in Shiram properties also very soon. Now, this particular entity, Omega Enterprise, uh, they own close to 1.6 crore shares, which is nearly 10% of the company's equity. Uh, and maybe they are the sellers or, or some other private equity will sell. But uh, for the last couple of months, there has been uh, you know, a lot of uh, equity getting changed hands in Shiram properties as well. Remember, the stock is still trading below the uh, IPO price of 113 odd rupees. So, uh, expect a large block in Shiram properties as well very, very soon. Okay, Dimesh, thanks a lot for that information. Let's go across to Ekta now. She's tracking Glenmark Pharma. Ekta, good morning. Morning. Well, interesting development with Glenmark, which they've announced. They've entered into an agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, which is the Department, the Antitrust Division. This is to resolve all court proceedings with the Department of Justice involving historical pricing practices by former employees for a cholesterol drug between 2013 and 2015. So it is basically uh, related to, you know, some allegations between that period of time. The company has entered into a three-year deferred prosecution agreement. So the Department of Justice will dismiss the indictment if in case the company adheres to the agreement which also includes a payment of $30 million payable in six installments. So $30 million is the overall settlement am amount. They are probably closing the issue with the Department of Justice with this. So net net, it should be taken positively considering that the overhang is now removed and the amount that they have to pay is over a period of time and is limited to $30 million. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Ekta. Hopping across to Rima. Rima, uh... You're telling us about l &T Technology Services. Uh, they had a management meet with MS? Uh, yes, so L uh, Man Morgan Stanley managed to meet the management of l &T Technology Services and these are the key takeaways. They're saying decision making is still slow, but there is a little bit of a pickup in the month of July versus the prior months, but you still have to go, to go through multiple layers of approval. The management also says they expect impacted verticals like semiconductor and high tech to improve or recover by Q4 of FI24. The management reiterated their commitment of achieving $1.5 billion of a revenue run rate by FI25 
market so that remains intact um, you know the management has given a guidance on margins they're talking about margins of 17 percent but Morgan Stanley was a bit conservative on margins their estimate was 16.7 percent but post their management meet uh, Morgan Stanley believes that margins may have a positive bias in FI24 compared to their own estimate so perhaps it will be closer to the management's own guidance back to you Okay, Reema, thanks a lot for that. We'll keep an eye out on l and Tech. But there are plenty of other stocks that are in the news this morning. So Sonal is here to give us the lowdown. Sonal, hi, good morning. Good morning, Sonia. Let me start with Brigade Enterprises. The company has gone ahead. They have bought a land parcel in Chennai. And this is a 6.54 acres of land parcel where they will be developing a residential project. Uh, so a lot of real estate companies entering the Chennai market as well. Adani Enterprises, where the promoter has raised stake to 69.87% versus 67.65%. This 2.22% has been acquired from August 7 to 18th. Uh, Rights and NHPC, they have signed an MOU for Rail Infrastructure Consultancy Works. So these two stocks will be in focus. Ramakrishna Forgings Limited because they had submitted a plan, a resolution plan for the acquisition under corporate insolvency resolution process for JMT Auto Limited. And it has now been approved by the NCLT. So that is a positive news. For Lemon Tree Hotels, they have signed two new properties. One is in Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. And the second one is in Kasoli, Himachal Pradesh. The Odisha project will be operational by quarter 4 of FI25 and the Kasoli project will be operational by quarter 3 of FI26. Okay, all right. Thanks uh, for that, uh, Sonal. Well, let's uh, give you a quick recap of all the stocks that we just covered. Most of them have positive news flow, so let's run it through the list. Union Bank, Sridharam Properties, Glenmark Pharma, l &T Technology, Brigade Enterprises, Adani Enterprises, Rates, RK Forgings, as well as Lemon Tree. All of them on the positive side, on the flip side. Owing to that large trade we'll like to see on SJS Enterprises, well, that one will open up in the red. Well, Abhishek's still with us. Uh, he's joining in to tell us about the brokerage notes that he's read early this morning. Uh, Abhishek, run us through the list. Uh, well, Nigel, to begin with, uh, Boffa has written on Bajaj Finance. Uh, they have a buy recommendation and a target price of 8750 per share. They say that there are multiple uh, levers to support growth and focus is on diversification for Bajaj Finance. So proactive action on unsecured growth, FI24 target in terms of growth remains intact. A higher cost of funds in the near term and uh, that could impact, uh, you know, however, uh, access to new liquidity pools uh, will also aid in controlling the cost of funds uh, rise. So the key growth levers is uh, customer acquisition, uh, funnel widening and new loan acceleration while product uh, launches and uh, calibrator scale up could also address the loan growth part. UBS has written on SDFC Bank a buy recommendation and a target price of 1,900 per share. They say that post mother there are three challenges and three opportunities. So the key challenges that they say is that uh, deposit gathering, growth and ROA differential. Uh, for merged entity they estimate 15% EPS uh, CAGR over FI24 to 26, uh, which is 4.5% to 5.5% decline versus standalone estimate. The stock may consolidate uh, in the near term uh, due to uncertainties. However, they expect a re-rating and relative outperformance versus private peers in FI25 for SDFC Bank. Uh, Nomura has written on Bharat Forge by recommendation target price of 1,157 per share. They say that there is potential uh, to be a leading defense exporter for Bharat Forge. So, company has built a sizable defense vertical with a large order book and is getting new orders which supports uh, their view in witnessing a sharp ramp up in FI 24 to 25. So, they estimate 20% plus EBITDA margins for defense sector. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. In fact, yesterday, Kalyani Strategic Systems bagged that two export orders worth 850 crores and that's when... Uh, uh, Bharat Forge had hit a fresh 52-week high. Now a lot of brokerages writing on that development. But uh, let's move on. The other big global headline is the U.S. 10-year yield hitting the highest level since 2007. And that's led to a fall in commodity prices. Uh, Manisha Gupta is joining in for a roundup of all the action overnight. Manisha, good morning. Morning. Oh, absolutely, yes, Sonia. The U.S. Treasury yield is doing all the damage for the commodity prices here. And I'll start with the crude oil prices where we did see 2% of decline in the previous week. Yesterday was another percentage of a decline. And we are just about holding $80 a barrel for the WTI crude with this one. Not just the crude oil prices, that's the scene across energy markets where you are looking at heating oil at a six-month high close. Uh, we are looking at gasoline futures trading at a two-week close as well. There is pressure that has come for the metal 
as well. Uh, apart from the U.S. Treasury yield, it is the China rate cut which disappointed the market. The street was working for the 15 basis point of a rate cut. You only got 10 basis points and there was no uh, rate cut for the five-year term loans. And that is what is weighing onto the market. Apart from that, there also is an increase in inventories for copper, zinc, steel, iron ore. At ports is at all-time highs in terms of inventories. That's weighing onto the street as well. There are discounts now on the ground. There is a demand really missing there, and that is weighing onto the prices. You've seen three weeks of constant decline for metals, and this seems to be turning out as a fourth week. The last two trading sessions have seen declines yet again. Okay, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. So, big fall is what you're seeing in metal prices globally, and that's, of course, on account of the move in the U.S. 10-year yield. But let's get talking about our own markets now. BEML is the first stock on our radar. For Q1 earnings, their consolidated revenues witnessed a decline, but the losses have narrowed. The company has uh, revised upwards their FY24 order book guidance to 17,000 crores. Shantanu Roy, the chairman and managing director at BEML, joins us now. Uh, Mr. Roy, your order book has been very healthy at almost 9,800 crores. And your FY24 order book guidance of 16,200 crores, which comes to a run rate of around 2,000 crores per quarter, uh, versus the 1,800 crores that you booked in Q1. Now, are you on track of achieving this guidance of 2,000 crores per quarter? And how is the order book shaping in the upcoming quarters for you? Yes, uh, I definitely see that we'll be able to meet our uh, uh, stated uh, number. Uh, you see, in the first uh, immediately after the first quarter, we have recently received the order for 3,100 crores of uh, metro contract for the Bangalore Metro. With that, our current order book is 12,800 crores. And in the uh, remaining period of the uh, financial year, up to March 2024, uh, we expect that uh, we'll have some seven to 9,000 more, uh, 9,000 crores more of order book. Uh, so with the, with the current uh, expectation of uh, our sales revenue of uh, uh, a growth of around 30% as compared to last year, we should be ending this year as on 31st March 2024 with the order book of around 17,000 crores. Okay, got that, uh, got that number down. But what is the split, sir, between defence, mining and rail and metro? Our present order book is 12,800 crores, out of which 60% uh, uh, is from the rail and metro orders, around 30% is from the defence aerospace orders, and 10% is from the mining and construction vertical. No, got that. Uh, so the cabinet has approved seven multi-tracking projects of Indian railways worth some 32,500 crore rupees. Could you tell us what are the implications uh, from this for BEML as you, as you see it on a conservative basis? Definitely, uh, the government's focus in the three verticals of defence in uh, rail and metro and uh, the infrastructure is, uh, is in line with the company's uh, uh, three business verticals of defense in aerospace, rail and metro, and mining and construction. And uh, the Vande Bharat trains, the defense opportunities uh, in, uh, uh, by our armed forces, and the metro opportunities that are coming up, like the Chennai Metro, the Mumbai Line 6, uh, the Patna Metro that will come up sometime later this year. So definitely there is a lot of traction uh, to the company's order book uh, because of these opportunities. Okay, so from all of these opportunities that you just spoke about, is there any incremental revenue and order book uh, that you can see, say, over the next 12 to 18 months? The numbers, as I said, I'm expecting, uh, say, seven to 9,000 crores of further order book uh, to be secured by the end of uh, this current financial year, uh, provided uh, uh, the, the, the contracts get closed within that time. But uh, definitely the opportunities are there. Uh, apart from the Vande Bharat, we also have uh, the aluminium trains for the push-pull car. And as I mentioned, the, the three metro projects that are expected to be uh, completed uh, within this uh, particular uh, financial year. And in defense, uh, uh, basically, there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunities on the high mobility vehicle. On, I'm, I'm only concentrating on uh, our core strengths, that is the high mobility vehicle, 
the engines, the bridging systems, as well as the uh, armoring division, the armored recovery vehicles. So based on uh, these uh, uh, core strengths of our company, uh, we expect uh, to have these numbers uh, by the end of uh, the current financial year. Got it. All right, uh, Mr. Roy, looking at the current market dynamics, defense and rail and metro, well, they're seen as the high growth segments. That compares with mining as well as construction. So tell us, what is the outlook on the product mix and what does it mean in terms of margins? You know, look at the historical uh, data. Uh, mining and construction has always uh, uh, contributed between 45 to 50 percent uh, to the overall revenue. Uh, in fact, last year, mining and construction contributed exactly 50 percent to the revenue. Uh, this year, uh, uh, my, our expectation is uh, that uh, the contribution from defense and aerospace as well as rail and metro put together will be around uh, 55 to uh, 58 percent. And the revenue contribution from mining construction will be around 42 percent. But still in absolute numbers, mining and construction will keep leading uh, for at least the next two to three years. Uh, the outlook uh, is uh, based on the growth drivers of uh, defense and aerospace and rail and metro. We should be looking at uh, a contribution of at least 65 uh, percent uh, from these two verticals in the next three to four years with mining construction contribution uh, becoming around 35 percent. And uh, as far as the margins are concerned, if you look at our performance over the last three years, the margins have uh, gone up substantially since 2019-20 uh, when we got uh, affected uh, because of uh, the COVID. And the company has uh, bounced back from uh, COVID and we have done pretty well. Uh, again, based on the rail and uh, defense, which are the key uh, growth areas, uh, our margins should further improve substantially. Uh, so how do you see the defense uh, book growing for you? Uh, any sort of internal targets set off by the company? Well, uh, we expect that the defense order book uh, at one stage will reach around uh, uh, eight to nine, uh, uh, around seven to eight thousand crores in the next three to four years, and uh, with that, uh, defense revenue can reach uh, somewhere between four thousand five hundred to five thousand crores in the next four to five years from now. Okay, just one more question. Uh, you know, a small question on what's happening on the operational front. Your Q one employee costs as a percentage of revenue is quite high at almost 36% if you compare it to the industry average of 14-15%. How do you see this faring in the upcoming quarters? Uh, you know, would employee costs continue to be uh, such a large chunk of your operational costs? Uh, as you rightly said, uh, in the first quarter, our employee cost as a percentage of revenue has been 36%. That is mostly because our fixed costs remain the same, whereas our sales revenue has been... Uh, quite low in the first quarter. And now uh, our employee cost in the last quarter was around 21%, uh, and not in the last quarter, but in the last financial year. So we expect uh, that with a revenue growth of around 25 to 30% this year, as compared to last year, uh, we will more or less uh, maintain uh, the employee cost around 20%. Uh, uh, so number one driver will be the increase in revenue, Number two driver will be the natural attrition on account of superannuation of our employees. In the next couple of years, uh, we expect that uh, around 25% of our workforce will uh, be uh, uh, leaving us on account of natural superannuation. At the same time, we'll be inducting. So for example, if 1,000 people retire, we'll be inducting some four to 500 uh, people so that you know there is a balance in the employee cost, but at the same time, we take care of the gaps in our skill sets as well. So net-net, uh, uh, our employee cost should hover around 20% in the current financial year as well, or maybe slightly lower than 20%. Okay, we got that uh, then. Well, Mr. Roy, final question before we let you go. You have a planned capex of closure on 200 crores. That's for FY24. That's for setting up ARV and HMV facilities. My question to you is, by when do these facilities become operational 
And what is the asset turnover? What kind of revenues and margins you can expect from this CAPEX? The CAPEX number that we have decided to infuse this year is around 5% uh, of our last year's revenue. And uh, the time for implementing the CAPEX is uh, between uh, 12 to uh, 15 months. So we can see the results coming up uh, uh, because of the CAPEX infusion, partly in 24-25, and it will be fully uh, uh, giving the results from the year 25-26. Okay, uh, well, uh, we'll leave it there, sir. Thank you very much for your time. It's always a pleasure having you with us here on CNBC TV 18. We'll take a quick commercial break here. Hemang Jani will join us on the other side with uh, some fundamental stock checks, th things that he likes right now, a view on the market. Stay tuned. That conversation in com is coming up. Yeah, check one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Welcome back. You're tuned into Bazaar Morning Call. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, for starters, the gift nifty is suggesting a start as flat as can be. So we continue to remain in that range. And for the time being, going by yesterday's close, we are packed in the middle of that range between 19,200 to around 19,600 odd. But plenty of stocks to discuss. And we have with us our market expert, Hemang Jani, who joins us on the show. Hi, Hemang. Good morning. Uh, thanks so much for joining in. Well, Imanga, you know, in uh, in the next few minutes or so, we're expecting a large trade from SJS, uh, uh, you know, the listed entity, didn't list too long ago. 
but the PE fund in there is looking to sell close to around 30 percent equity. Have you been tracking this? And uh, you know, this has been something that the market has been waiting for quite a long time. Your take. Yeah, good morning, Nigel. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, uh, is this enterprise, uh, you know, there was an overhang of almost about 30% uh, stake, which is uh, held by, you know, Evergrande. And uh, uh, to that extent, uh, the stock was going through a bit of a, a, you know, dull patch. Operationally, the company has been doing pretty well. If you see the last quarterly numbers, there was a significant improvement, both in terms of top line, which was up almost about 24% and uh, profitability and margins. So I think, uh, you know, there is a case for some sort of a pullback in the stock once uh, this uh, overhang goes away, as we all know that, uh, you know, operationally that segment is going pretty well. Okay. Hey, Mang, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. Uh, what do you do in a market where a lot of the large caps have fallen about 9, 10, 12% from their highs across the board, right? Whether it's Reliance, ITC, HDFC Bank, SBI, and these are good quality large cap names. Uh, do you buy them now, add them to your portfolio? If yes, which are the ones you like? So, uh, Sonia, uh, what has happened is that at the index level from the top, we have seen about 3.5-4% kind of a cut. And at stock level, it could vary depending upon uh, which pocket it belongs to. So I think uh, broadly, the structure of the market is looking uh, good. And we've just concluded the quarterly earnings. And as we all know that at the nifty level, the growth was 32%. So I think pockets where one can really look to uh, buy into are, you know, something like banks where the overall, uh, you know, outlook and the growth remains quite good, though there are certain pockets of pressures on the NIM front, but I don't think you have major structural issue there. Apart from that, I think uh, cement could be one space where there is a lot of, uh, you know, action, the, the margin pressure is over, there is a possibility of some m and &A. So I think the cement as a pack, maybe Ultratech, some of the mid-cap cement companies is where one can really look at. And also we feel that, uh, you know, some of the uh, names like Reliance, where a major corporate action is over now, Geofinance has got listed. The stock has actually corrected a bit. So that again provides a great entry point. It uh, provides a great entry uh, point. Uh, the uh, entire uh, Adani Group stocks were rallying yesterday, Himang. Any thoughts? Uh, on any of the names here? So Prashant, uh, there are a couple of things here when it comes to Adani Group. One is that, of course, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, new investor or the new company where the existing investor is lapping up the stock. Let's say in case of Adani Power, there was a substantial buying that really happened by GQG Partners. Uh, that is helping to some extent. Secondly, as far as uh, this, uh, you know, SEBI matter is concerned in the final hearing by the Supreme Court, I think as we are approaching, uh, you know, that uh, there is a certain degree of uh, action which is happening. Overall, I think that continues to be a high beta space. So, uh, you know, for traders who are looking for, uh, you know, some sort of a punt, I think that this could be a good, uh, you know, space to be in. But I think having seen such a big outperformance at these levels, it would not make sense for, you know, retail investors to get into it. Okay, all right. Uh, hey, Mang, I want to ask you about uh, Reliance Geo. Uh, you know, the Geo Financial Services that listed yesterday, it was at lower circuit. Now, that's a, only 1% weightage on the index. But yesterday, there were a lot of sell orders on that one. What's your view? Where do you expect the stock price to settle at? So, Nigel, there are certain technical factors, almost about three and a half to 4,000 crore, uh, you know, selling uh, is, is happening because of the uh, selling by the index funds. At the same time, uh, you know, you will see uh, buying uh, because of the inclusion in the MSCI and couple of global indices, which will happen probably over next, let's say, three to five day period. So, short term, the stock could remain a bit subdued. But I don't see much of a, you know, downside from current levels because of the fact that, you know, the, the, the market cap is around 160,000 crore and, and the way the entire, you know, opportunity is uh, coming up uh, and the way the company has gone about building the team, the way, you know, the business plans are, is going to unfold. So I think uh, for, let's say, two to three years, this could be a great, uh, you know, opportunity, something similar to maybe an HDFC bank uh, that got listed way back. Uh, but short term, I think uh, because of these technical factors, you might see a bit of a subdued movement. Okay. Well, uh, Himang, uh, <clears throat> stay with us. We'll take a very quick commercial break here. We'll uh, have our technical uh, experts also joining in. Midesh and Sudarshan will be with us with uh, their thoughts on uh, what they're making of uh, the trade setup. 
and of course individual ideas as well. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so what, eight minutes to go for the pre-open session. Mitesh and Sudarshan are with us with uh, what they're making of the trade uh, this morning. Gentlemen, good morning. Mitesh, uh, let me start with you. How are things looking? We left off just around the 19400 level. Uh, flattish kind of start indicative, at least like what we saw yesterday. But yesterday we got a decent move higher. Uh, what would you do? Morning, Prashant. So, you know, uh, in a broader sense, I've maintained that the market will be ranged between 19200 and 19650, uh, give and take a few points. And I think yesterday's move was part of the uh, move which uh, suggests that the lower end has been tested. And now the Nifty might try to move towards the upper end of it. So, why today the opening will be flat? Any 20, 30 point intraday dip if you get, buy here with the star below 19,300. And I would now look at targets of 19600, 650 as the uh, target area for the next four to five sessions. Similarly, on the bank nifty, I think this 4400 was a very key support area. Uh, the bank nifty never tested that level, um, uh, has managed to reverse from there. But the structure wise and the outperformance wise, the bank nifty is weaker of the two. So, bank nifty, you know, I would want to avoid, but it's the nifty which I would want to play in case I get a mild dip today. Okay, so if there's a mild dip on the index, then you want to trade the nifty. Got that. So Darshan Sukhani is also with us. So Darshan, uh, you've been saying ad nauseum that this is a market that has perhaps moved to a sell-on rally and the trend is on the downside. Do you continue to stick with that view or at some point in the day, do you think an intraday trade on the upside uh, could show up? Yeah, good morning. Actually, I changed that view yesterday itself. 
in the morning i suggested that today is a date when we want to buy on a dip and we got that dip and we got a very decent long trade also that view continues for the day today again the chances are that we will follow the us markets follow the asian markets the early signs and see some kind of a rally so look for minor dips in the morning go long now this is not a market where you want to carry positions you carry a position only if the market is closing very strong at the highs of the day if that happens you carry a position otherwise primarily keep it intraday the much more interesting part is that the bank nifty is giving the same signs as the nifty and suggesting that it is also available for intraday buying Okay, all right. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Well, Sudarshan, uh, you continue. You tell us what are uh, your stock calls for the day. Well, SBI Card is my only intraday short. The stock has been falling consistently, had a small rally, and then again a decline. It's a very unusual chart. Every day declines. It's an intraday short with a stop above eight forty-three. PFC is a buying opportunity after a big rally. The stock is consolidating. It should. I would expect the consolidation to move on the upside. Buy with a stop under 260. Sun TV has a similar pattern: big rally, consolidation. Buy with a stop under 530. And Tata Communications, again a similar pattern: big up move, a current consolidation. Buy with a stop under 1660. Okay, <clears throat> got that, uh, Sudarshan. Mitesh, what about you? So I also have more of buy calls. Uh, MRPL as a cash stock, I'd like to start with. Uh, gave a breakout to new swing highs yesterday. Buy here with a stop at 89 for the first target of 96. Tata Power, there was some uh, breakout from bullish pattern in the intraday charts. That's a buy with a stop at 233 for targets of 252. And Dixon is a conditional buy. The, the trend is on the upside, but there's an intraday pivot at 4910. So once the stock starts getting past that. Buy with a stop below forty-eight fifty, and fifty fifty is the first target. And one sell call that's on Indian Hotel. Uh, it's on giving a, a pattern breakdown if it starts trading below three seventy-six. So then go short with a stop at three eighty-three for a first target of three sixty. All right, uh, gentlemen. Good to speak with both of you as always. Thanks very much, Mitation, Mitation Sudarshan, and we'll uh, chat again at nine ten. Uh, later down from now, just about four minutes to go for the pre-open. We'll take a quick break here. The pre-open will come up, and so will the management of Aeroflex Industries to talk about the company's IPO that opens today. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting one. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with them. Welcome back. This is Open Exchange. You're watching us uh, from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studio. Let's get talking about the FNO market now. Manoj Murli Dharan, Vice President Derivatives at Relica Broking, is joining us. Manoj, good morning and thanks for being with us on the channel. Uh, your thoughts on the market? Do you think this range-bound trend is something that can continue? And what are you looking at in terms of individual stocks today? Uh, good morning, Sonia. I guess uh, it might be right because uh, the position that we have on the Nifty August futures is just around 1.02 crores. So close to 10 odd lakhs were shed into the um, in the market in the last five to six odd sessions. So the equation is we were at 19600. There was some shorting, and at 19250 there is a support which is seen, and almost 10 lakhs of Nifty has been taken out of the market. So now ideally this is a good situation because now the market is almost neutral with a bit positive bias because yesterday in that 19350 strike, if you see the put writing was very intense. And we believe that might sustain at least in the 24th, uh, which is a weekly expiry. So 19300 to 350 as a base, the Nifty has a potential of 19500. But I'm afraid, does it go beyond 19500? As of now, we doubt that. So at least buy and dip for this 100-150 odd point should be the favor, and that's a trend for the Nifty. Now, sector specific, we believe IT yesterday has buckled the trend, and yes, there is good delivery buying also. So we still like Tata Steel at 170. The stock price should be 115, and we believe that this stock has a potential of almost 121 to 122. So that's the first trade. Uh, in the IT space, uh, we like Infosys as well. We believe uh, post results also. If you see uh, 1380 to 1390, that is the base where there is good delivery buying. So almost at 1400 for the August futures, you can go long 1380 as a stop loss, and a target of close to 1430 should be in the offer. Okay, all right, uh, Manoj. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in, and giving us uh, those calls. Uh, well, uh, time to move on then, and uh, 
Aeroflex Industries. That's a 350 crore IPO. It opens up uh, for subscription. Out of the 351 crores, 151 crores will be fresh issue, and the remainder will be by the OFS route. The company has already raised close to 104 crore from its anchor investors. To help us out, to understand the company better, and what's their vision from here on, Asa Dhurd, uh, the MD at Aeroflex Industries, joins us on the show. Uh, hi, Asa, thanks so much for coming across uh, to our studio. And uh, you must be a big moment, right? You all have bought this company, turned it around, and prospects could be looking up. Now, a couple of questions out sure, here. Sure. You know, I'm looking at the way you've priced your uh, IPO. It's a little over 100 rupees odd. Yep. But just a few months ago, you all had placed some shares with some of the big names in the market. Okay. Ms. Ashish Kacholia, you have uh, Mr. Jagdish Master as well, at around uh, 85, 87 rupees odd. What has changed so much that suddenly you're coming out with an IPO at more than 25% premium in comparison to that placement? So actually, uh, with a lot of these investors, we started the conversation from the end of January and the start of uh, February. Uh, and those uh, discussions happened on the numbers of December. And if you see that from December to the March numbers, and now obviously because the parent company uh, of Aeroflex, Sat Industries is already listed, on the stock exchange and we have already announced the results for that for Q1. Mm -hmm. If you see the PE, uh, the PE multiple that we gave to these investors and the PE multiple that we are currently offering, so it's actually uh, it's at, a, at a lesser PE multiple if you see from that aspect. So we have uh, you know taken all of that into consideration uh, you know to ultimately price the IPO. So also. your rationale basically is that the numbers improved, that's why you are asking for uh, uh, you know, a higher price, but you believe that the P is less than the what it P was? The P is lesser, yeah. That, the P is lesser, but obviously because the numbers have improved, so the price... Okay, I've uh, got that. I said, uh, tell us a little bit about the company itself. I mean, viewers would want to know. I mean, just the basics. What do you do? Do you really, do you have a moat? Do you have a competitive advantage? Uh, start there. Yeah. So first of all, we are in uh, we are into manufacturing of metallic flexible flow solutions. So these uh, solutions are used for the smooth flow and transfer of any kinds of liquids, gases, and solids. So it, it could be oxygen, so nitrogen, you make metal, hydrogen. Metal tubes, very simply, metal tubes, very simple. Metal tubes, but which is flexible. So okay. uh, because generally metal tubes are mostly uh, rigid, but what we manufacture is flexible tubes. Okay. So. That is a moat, uh, and we supply to all the you know the critical industries like oil and gas and petrochemicals, and the new age industries like fire sprinklers, solar, and uh, EV, and all of these. Industries. How is the company placed in the uh, in the in the marketplace? I mean, do you have who's your nearest competitor? What's the what's the size of the market first of all? Uh, and, and what's your share and who are the other competitors? So if you see the global market, uh, because 80% of our sales is from export, so if you see the global market would be about uh, $3 billion. And if you see our turnover of exports, so we would be uh, catering uh, approximately 1% of the entire market. Now, currently in terms of competition, there is no listed co company in India right now who's into the similar line of business as ours. So we'll be creating a new uh, category on the stock exchanges. Okay. All right. Asa, the, you know, for the last year, your revenues were what, around 270 crores yes, approximately? Right, yeah. Your PBT was roughly around 40, 41 crores yes, or thereabouts. Right. But your operating cash flows is only around 3-4 crores odd. Yeah. So, uh, you know, explain that to us. And are you expecting this operating cash flows, which is a key dynamic from a market perspective, to improve from year on? We're not asking for specific numbers. Yeah. On listing, we will want that. Yeah. But for the time being, if you could tell us, are things going to improve from year on? So... So first of all, uh, uh, the reason for the cash flow from operations being low, b because if you see the last year, uh, the, uh, there was an increase in inventory. There was also an inc increase in uh, receivables. This was on, on account of the supply chain issues that we faced because of this uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war. Hmm. And that led to a slightly higher in in inventory cycle and slightly higher data cycle. But uh, we have already started working on it and uh, you know the results you know you would see very soon about the improvements that we have done both from our uh, our procurement to also from our sales uh, you know strategy okay uh, asad hi good morning so just have a couple of uh, questions on that front um, do you expect your operating cash flows to improve over the next uh, 12 to 18 months if yes what would it be like? And there is a little bit of pressure on your balance sheet in the sense your you know, working capital cycles are also much longer. There's pressure that you're seeing in terms of receivables as well. Can you give us some more internals on how all of this would shape up? So uh, in terms of the working capital cycle, so uh, you know, since we are an exporter and more than 80% of our sales is from exports, uh, 
and also about 40% of our raw material we are uh, currently importing. So we need to keep sufficient inventory to ensure to a smooth flow of our production and plus we take about four to six weeks for the pr production at a manufacturing plant because we manufacture uh, the, our products from a quarter inch to 14 inches and we have more than 82 lines of machines. Hence the reason for the high inventory and we have already started working on the debtors cycle. Uh, the reason for the last year increase was, I'll, you know, like I mentioned about the, the issue between the Russia and uh, Ukraine which led to uh, slightly uh, uh, disruptions in the supply chain and for the first 3-4 uh, months of last year. But uh, we are starting to see that uh, ease out uh, in the current financial year. So you said you're working on your debtor cycles. Can you tell us the trade receivables? Uh, currently, what is it at and how much do you uh, think you can, you know, bring it down by over the next, say, 12 to 18 months? So, uh, uh, approximately the trade the receivables currently stand at about 75 days on an average. Uh, so our aim is over the next f few years. Uh, to go uh, to, to go to uh, at least for the first stage to go to 60 days and then obviously much better in, in the future as well. Mm. Okay. Uh, sir, the, sorry, just a, a yeah. quick point, uh, both from raw material uh, mm. sort of assure, assuredness, right? Uh, so steel is the biggest raw material? Stainless steel, yeah. Stainless steel. So do you have, uh, where do you procure it from? Do you have uh, sort of uh, tie-ups? And on the front end, when you sell, do you have the, are these longer-term contracts? Because if... When you get a price shock, are you able to pass it on immediately with a lag? How does it work? So, first of all, talking about the raw metal side, so there are two kinds of raw metal that we buy. One is the uh, the wire and, and one is the coil. So, in terms of wire, 100% we are buying from India. In terms of the coil, we are expo uh, importing about 70% uh, uh, currently, but we are uh, looking at, uh, you know, creating an alternate of a supplier in India who can, uh, you know, supply us the coil. Uh, you know, uh, that is with, with regards to our raw material. Now, with regards to our customers, so with a uh, few of our customers, we have uh, uh, long-term uh, contracts. So, so they gave us the planning for the entire year and then they break it down into um, monthly and quarterly uh, POs. And then we have to, you know, uh, dispatch the material as per that. In terms of the pricing, so uh, in case there is minor changes in prices, about 2 to 3% uh, that we bear. But in case the price changes are more than 4 to 5%, it is there in the agreement that the price increase will be, will be actually passed on uh, to the customer. Now, just to add to that one more point, that uh, pre-COVID, the prices of stainless steel were more or less uh, constant. Mm. It, it is just that in the last two years of, uh, you know, the disruption that had happened, there was uh, volatility in the prices. But now in the past seven, eight months, again, the price have uh, stabilized. So, oh, Okay, yeah. got it. And now, uh, you said that some part of your, uh, I think, your coils, you're yeah. importing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So out of that, how much comes in from China? Uh, the most of the import is from China, China as well. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to ask you on that front, yep. Renee. Since China is going through a slowdown, yep. you know, it may not be very good for some of these stainless steel manufacturers. Yep. But for you, since it's your input cost on the margin, could it be a benefit for you? Since you know China is slowing down, they're not consuming yep. most of what they are producing, which is a fear for the globe. But if you are you know buying from them, then it will be on the contrary a positive for your margins, or is it just a pass through? No, so uh, in terms of uh, the margin, so, you know, actually we are uh, looking to slightly uh, debottling from China. The okay. reason being that, uh, like I said, 70% of the coil is from China, but we are looking at uh, Indian manufacturers to buy from them, you know, you know because of the, the geopolitical issues with China. So we want to de-risk ourselves from, from that aspect as well. Okay. All right. Final question before we let you go with the yep. current investment that you have. Yep. What is, you know, with the current gross block? What is the peak sales that you can do? We're not asking you for a guidance yet yeah. again, but what is the peak sales? Last year you did 270 crores. Correct. At peak, what can you achieve? So uh, generally, our, our fixed asset turnover ratio is about four and a half to five. So uh, with the capex that that we are doing through our internal approvals, if you uh, extrapolate uh, that, you'll get a fair idea about uh, you know uh, where we can go over the next four to five years. Give so. us a number. Uh, say so. Uh, we, we have been growing uh, the last three years at 35% CAGR. So if you do the same math, so we are expecting at least a, a three to four fold uh, jump in our numbers over the next four years. Okay, so around.
maybe four digits, right? Uh, thousand crores, yeah. By three, Hopefully. four years. All right. Yeah. Asad, uh, lovely speaking with you. Thank, Thank you very you much for joining us Thank here you so much. in the studio. Wishing Thank you all luck. the best. And Thank on the so IPO much. listing, we look forward to chatting sure. with you again. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank very you. much. Well, we'll uh, it's uh, 910, which means we get our 910 uh, calls out of the way. Four minutes to go for the market uh, open. Sudarshan is with us. So is Mitesh. Gentlemen, what do you have? Sudarshan, you go first. Tata Communications, I'm sorry, Tata Communications is a buy with a stop under 1660. Mitesh, what about you? With a buy on Dixon for a target of 50-50 and a stop at uh, 48.50. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Mitesh. Well, uh, Nimesh is uh, joining in now to tell us about the standout brokerage report that he's picked up. Nimesh. Hi, Nigel. So today's standout is on Aurobindo Pharma. City Group has today downgraded the stock to sell from buy. Well, they have raised the target price to 750. It's largely on roll forward. At 750, it indicates a, a potential 12.5% downside from the current levels. Now, City believes that the near-term upside levers are priced in, and uh, they see a limited comfort in terms of pipeline. Well, after the recent rally in the stock price, the valuation are, are at uh, 2.5 standard deviation and 1.5 standard deviation above the five-year and 10-year average mean, and uh, factoring in most of the near-term uh, earnings levers which includes the likes of launch of uh, generic Relvamid, commercialization of Penji, which is under PLI, and any potential improvement in the injectable sales. Now, uh, you know, uh, City does not, doesn't see any material improvement in the U.S. generic uh, dynamics, barring some near-term uh, price stability and volume, uh, volume upside. So, on back of the recent rally, valuations are expensive now, and hence a downgrade on Aurobindo Pharma to sell, and they have target price of 750, a potential 2.5% downside from current levels. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So, City downgrading Aurobindo Pharma over there. A couple of more stocks in focus this morning. One of them is Lemon Tree Hotels, uh, up almost about 2 odd percent on the launch of a couple of new hotels. That one is looking pretty good. In fact, it's had a good run this year, up about 25 percent. And GSPL is the other stock on our radar. Sonal is here to tell us why. Sonal, over to you. Thank you so much for that. Well, Morgan Stanley has cut the target price of GSPL for a number of reasons. They are bearish on the stock because they expect only 2% CAGR in terms of volume growth over the next three years. They say that this is just one-third of the company's average gas demand growth as well. Its dependence on refinery and power sector demand is something which is driving the weakness for the company as well. Alternatives like domestic gas, pet coke and coal remain more competitive versus LNG. L uh, the company imports LNG and then uh, gives it to different sectors like CGD, space power and refineries as well. They see GSPL's volumes remaining 17% below pre-COVID levels and loss of demand from Reliance's refinery to continue as Reliance is now sourcing its own production in terms of pet coke as well. The hold code discount because it holds a stake in Gujarat gas has come in at 54% versus the long-term average of 50% and they expect it to go higher as well uh, because of the underperformance that we are seeing versus the peers and versus Gujarat gas as well. Uh, they are awaiting a regulatory tariff hike as well which is not come about and that is the other reason why Morgan Stanley is bearish on the stock. They expect volume growth to be capped at 32 MMS CMD uh, because of significant exposure to global LNG prices which have been going higher and that is negative for the company. They have lowered the target price to 265 versus 390 rupees per share and they are underweight on the stock. All right, Sonal, thanks a lot for that. Well, just 20 more seconds and we're heading into the market opening. 10 seconds left. And the rupee opening actually has been uh, slightly on the higher side, 83.08 compared to a close of 83.11 that we saw yesterday. And that's the opening bell that you can see. First tick on the index is absolutely flat with a bit of a positive bias, you'd have to say. The Nifty hanging on to the 19,400 mark. The Nifty Bank actually is supporting up almost about 100 odd points right now. And uh, what's leading from the front is a couple of these Adani group stocks, Adani Enterprises, Adani Ports are in the green. You have HDFC Live that's up almost 7 tenths of a percent. Uh, UPL, Power Grid, BPCL, a couple of other stocks that are in the green right now. And LNT, LTI, Mindtree, Sun Pharma, Titan are a couple of other names that are holding up at the moment. Uh, what's not looking good this morning is Reliance Industries. It's a tad bit soft. I mean, nothing alarming. Tata Consumer Products and a couple of these IT names coming off a tad bit. Infosys is down almost about 0.2%. Uh, Bharti Airtel, Aisha Motors, Britannia are a couple of other names that are just trending in the red right now. So all in all, you'd have to say that, um, okay, that, there's that deal, by the way, on SGS Enterprises, where 33% equity has changed hands. Uh, Nimesh was telling us about that. Uh, so keep that on your radar as well. But by and large, the market is very quiet. The opening is very quiet. And uh, you'd have to say that individual stocks are, you know, a few newsmakers here and there. 
Uh, on the upside, though, Adani Group stocks are topping the charts this morning. But Nigel, what else are you noticing in the broader markets this morning? Well, uh, you know, one stock that's reacting to Nimish's standard brokerage report, City on Oro, uh, you know, they've downgraded the stock as uh, Nimish told us. From buy to sell, revised target price at around 750 rupees, so that one's down 2.5%. IEX is uh, pulling back a little bit, it's down close to around 2% as we speak. On the flip side, you have NCC that's up close to around 2%. What a big move that stock has had. Here to date, it's up close to around 80%. It's moving very, very well. India Bulls Housing Finance as well, up close to around 2% to kickstart trade. And a couple of other notable movers, I think uh, Adani Pa, that's one of the big volume uh, movers today. Well, that stock, in fact, uh, is up close to around 5% as we speak. Lemon Tree as well, up 2.5%. So a pretty good start, actually, from a broader market perspective. Though the headline index, as we said earlier, is still in a bit of that range. You know, uh, for the second day running, the Adani Group stocks are uh, basically what is uh, uh, what is leading. And uh, we were discussing that with Hemang in the morning. Adani Transmission, Enterprises, Power. So, you know, uh, those were a part of the Nifty and uh, outside, outside the Nifty as well, doing quite, uh, quite decently well. <clears throat> what else? Uh, you know, Jupiter Wagons is, again, once again, locked up, uh, limit up 5% higher. Stocks at about, what, 300 now. Uh, so, uh, you know, as we were high pointing around the same time yesterday, some 200, 250% this year. Uh, Lemon Tree, we highlighted, Scient DLM will come up. It did very well yesterday, and uh, it's up another 2.5%, 3% this morning. There is Chennai Petro, which is up uh, 2%, stocks at about 376. Uh, there is Repco Home, which is up about 2.7, 2.8-odd percent. Uh, car Trade is up uh, 4%. There is Brigade, which is up about 2% or so. And then, I mean, volumes kind of start to taper off. This is the bulk of what is doing well uh, with decent-sized uh, gains. Uh, so, Geo Finance, I think, Geo Financial is uh, down uh, 5%. Like yesterday, there is a bit of a selling uh, pressure, which is uh, there. So, 236 on a Geo Financial as we start. IEX is down one and a quarter percent And there is Titagar, which is down about 1.6% percent as well. Uh, and, of course, there's a the big block of SJS. Stock is absolutely flat with a 1% uh, sort of move uh, lower. 15 points on the Nifty. So, this is really quiet uh, so far. So, let's see. 19,400. Just above 19,400 is where the Nifty is holding up uh, for now. Andrew Holland is with us, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Avengers Capital Public Markets Alternate Strategies. Uh, Andrew, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Go where the momentum is. That's... Uh, you know, uh, some not your philosophy, but I mean uh, that that's worked for you. So where where are you finding momentum? Oh, sure, we're finding momentum anywhere at the moment, uh, <laughs> Prashant. It's uh, kind of one of these markets where we keep kind of flipping uh, on the kind of negative to uh, recovering. But I think I think that still the the, the risks are to the downside uh, for a number of factors, and and you know I think we get lulled into this. Um, I don't know how to say it, but uh, in, in in terms of you know all the China woes means that everyone loves India, um, which is uh, which is obviously benefiting uh, kind of flows, um, but you know that could change. I mean, you know the the Chinese uh, authorities have have really just um, um, you know kind of uh, you know, haven't used any 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 kind of bazookas yet to to fire the economy up, and, and that's causing a lot of uh, kind of concerns and. Um, you know, kind of reduction in confidence uh, uh, from businesses to, to you know, to, to the investors uh, in that market. But if they do something, instead of using a pea shooter, they use a bazooka, um, then that obviously could have a, you know, a, a very, very strong uh, be a positive impact for not just for the economy, but investor thinking at the moment, which is, uh, I would say, probably at its all time low. So we're benefiting from that. Uh, but it's not enough of a catalyst to get our markets higher, right? So um, we have our own concerns about the monsoons, El Nino, um, and if you look at the kind of import-export figures, it's starting to drift down. So there's a bit of worry about the economy slowing now, um, which is uh, which is okay, but uh, I, I don't think that's taken into account in, in, in the valuations, um, which are still around 20 times PE compared to, to the rest of uh, emerging markets. So will benefit from the China negativity, but it's it can't be just that one factor which is helping us. Okay, by the way, the market is very quiet, actually. Not too much action happening in early morning trade. The Nifty Bank is quiet as well with just a bit of gains.
But a couple of stock do, stocks do deserve mention. Adani Power is now up almost about 5 odd percent and Zomato is coming back, so 3% higher on Zomato. These platform companies have actually done quite well and Lemon Tree Hotels at a fresh 52 week high. Uh, Andrew, good morning and thanks for joining in on the show. So you're saying that this is a market where, um, you know, there are not enough catalysts for the market to go up and there is a bit of worry about the economy slowing down. So what do you do at a time like this? Do you, uh, you know, in your asset allocation strategy, do you move away from equities and into fixed income, into debt for a bit, considering we have these challenges upon us? No, I don't think you, you need to take, uh, I mean, for, for investors, obviously, they can take a call in terms of, uh, you know, they're, they're getting good yields uh, in fixed income. And that's where you've been seeing a lot of uh, investors shift money from in the short term away from equities. So as I said, there's no real catalyst. Um, but, you know, we've we've maintained throughout the kind of past year or so that it's not the index that um, you necessarily should look at it. It's the themes below the index, which, you know, you should play. And we, we talked about these many times. And, and and a lot of them, you know, have done very well. Um, but to the point where, you know, there's not, even in those kind of uh, areas, you know, the, the valuations of, uh, and the share prices have moved quite quickly uh, to capture some of that uh, excitement, uh, for, you know, for the, not just for the short term, but for the longer term in those sectors. So that's why we're all kind of tr trying to find new areas uh, new companies, um, you know, which will uh, which will uh, you know beat the index uh, handsomely, uh, and it's becoming a little bit more tough at this point because um, you know the, the 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 overall kind of uh, slowdown that we're starting to see um, is just starting to play through in the commentary by by uh, by companies as well. So it's something I'm not overly concerned about, um, but it's something that will just take the edge off our market. Uh, in, the, in the very short term. But so I don't think you need to do so much asset allocation between debt and equity, but I think uh, uh, a lot of people did at the end of, uh, at the back end of the year, right, uh, in March, um, when, when the taxation changed. Okay, all right. Hi, Andrew. Good morning. Nigel on this side. You know, Andrew, when you joined us the last time around, ITC, that demerger was just announced. And from a longer perspective, obviously, it's quite positive. But that one has pulled back close to 10, 12 percent uh, from the peak. Uh, you know, that's just in the last one month or so. View on ITC uh, from a uh, year on, because that's been one of the big outperformers actually in the past 18 months. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, uh, again, it's kind of one of those where the, the expectations were very high. Uh, obviously, the hope was, um, uh, well, the fact that they are uh, the, the emerging the hotel business, but it's going to take time, right? It, I, I think yeah, it's yeah. going to. A 12-month process. So, if that's the case, then you know that kind of short-term excitement of um, you know uh, creating value it just goes away. And I think that's what we've seen. Also, say with Reliance more more in the short term. You know, you create that value. It's in the price, um, and and then uh, you know investors uh, are waiting for the next catalyst, which is uh, probably a little bit of time away. So, uh, again, nothing to worry about in either of the stocks. But you know that short-term kind of run that you saw in both of them um, was was uh, really buoyed by the fact that there was some demerger kind of news coming out, which was uh, uh, valuations, uh, as you as you as you know, were kind of a lot higher, I think, or expectations were a lot higher than probably reality is. <clears throat> Look at Zomato, uh, which is up 4%, by the way. Uh, stocks at about 94, and it's the largest, second largest volume uh, led gainer Across the board, uh, the first is, of course, Adani Power with that big move. Uh, but Zomato is now uh, <clears throat> at the day's high on uh, large volumes. Patel Engineering, I mean, actually smaller and smaller names, right? I mean, Patel Engineering is up three and a half, big volumes. It's a number four with volumes. There is Birla Cable out of the blue, 9% move. Uh, again, you know, uh, for a stock like Birla Cable, volumes are large at this point in the day. Uh, look at Moripun Laboratory, 6%. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jupiter wagons earlier. Bajaj Electricals is up about 4%. Uh, uh, Voltamp is up 5%. So you're kind of rotating into lower and lower, uh, you know, in terms of the market cap uh, curve. Talbros Auto, I mean, it's a, that's a good company. And uh, it's also done very, very well. It's up uh, 100% this year. It's got a 8%, 9% move after the last few days of uh, sideways kind of consolidation. Uh, so that is, again, I mean, but, you know, volumes are very uh, small. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so we're talking smaller and smaller. Um, so, you know, just that point, uh, Andrew, right? Uh, you have to go down 
and then find the smaller stuff. Uh, uh, so what does that tell you? I mean, you know, once you rotate and rotate and rotate and uh, there's nothing left to rotate into, that hardly happens ever, right? You don't run out of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you don't, but you could be the last man standing holding the stuff when it starts to fall. So that's the, uh, that's always the concern, uh, Prashant. I, 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 listen, I think there's, there's a few things that uh, we just need to watch out in the, in, in, in the near term. And I'm not being overly negative here on India. I'm very constructive in the, in, the, in the kind of medium term. But, you know, we've got Jackson Hole this week where the Federal Reserve will talk. Um, I think it's going to be the same hawk yourself, long, higher for longer. Uh, bond yields are at five percent. Two-year bond yields in the US are at five percent. Uh, the UN and the and the and the Japanese yen keep depreciating. Not good for emerging markets, uh, to my mind. Uh, and we're still awaiting a stimulus from China. So, if any of those things don't happen, uh, I, I think markets are going to you know, be tested in 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 the kind of uh, from September onwards because there's a lot of hope. Um, in terms of the Goldilocks scenario of a soft landing, which I've, I, I don't remember ever seeing, and I've been in the market quite a long time, as, as, as you have as well, um, and um, and that earnings will, will, will be fantastic. Let's see what Nvidia does tomorrow. Um, if that can, uh, you know, any disappointment there will, will will obviously have a big impact on that uh, AI um, kind of theme play, which is uh, all over the place. Okay. Well, you know, just before we let you go, I do want your thoughts on what one should do with the auto space now. I ask you because uh, if you notice this month, in the month of August, the auto stocks have started to come off a bit. So Hero Moto, for example, is your biggest loser this month, down 10%. The others as well, right? Bajaj Auto, Maruti are coming off a bit. You think the uh, up cycle has now ended or would you use this as an opportunity to buy these names? You know, I saw it's a very good question. I, I, I saw an interesting report the other day by uh, by a broker saying that um, discounts on, on cars have started to increase a lot more significantly than they expected. Um, they weren't calling for a, a demand slowdown yet, um, but they were very close to it. So I think it, it will have to watch and see what those discounts, if they continue to be high, uh, and then see if that's a demand problem, because that's uh, obviously something that the prices might be trying to bake in right now uh, without the full evidence of being that it's a demand problem. It's maybe just discounts by the dealers uh, to get things moving. But uh, it's a worrying sign. All right, uh, Andrew, final question before we let you go. You know, a couple of domestic uh, themes uh, have come into play as well, but I think uh, the bigger threat is coming from the globe. So how do you approach some of these uh, companies, you know, the IT space in particular? The last quarter, well, it was more or less a weakish quarter and visibility for the first half at least isn't really there. But valuation-wise, well, some of them are trading little above their main and they have good balance sheets as well, dividend paying. Uh, how do you approach the IT, IT space from here? I think I'd wait another quarter before wanting to kind of have full conviction. And the reason I'm saying that uh, is twofold. One is I still think valuations are not uh, not taking into account potential downgrades in the next two to three months. Um, but there there again, I'm still of the view that, uh, you know, interest rates will start falling in the U.S. Um, by the back end of the year. And that will be good for the technology stock. So I think we're just a quarter away from, from, from you know, putting a, a more of a buy signal on the IT stocks. I just think there's in the short term, there's a there's a few headwinds which will, uh, will bring the share prices down. Right, uh, Andrew, as always, great speaking with you. Thanks for joining us on the channel. I appreciate your Thank thoughts. Thank you. That's Andrew Holland saying there's definitely some caution. Uh, Thank you. Some caution in the system prevails for sure. And uh, the Jackson Hole Symposium, which happens on Friday, they're expecting some hawkish talk from Jerome Powell over there. But let's move on. The mid-cap index actually is picking up quite a bit. So don't be fooled by the headline index and the flatline move there. The mid-cap index is now up almost six-tenths of a percent. So clearly all the action is beneath the surface. Federal Bank is on our radar now. IFC has invested almost uh, 959 crores in Federal Bank via the preferential allotment route. IFC's holding in Federal Bank has now risen to 8.1%. Also, Federal Bank's QIP of 3,040 crores is getting a very strong response. Harsh Dugar, who's joined as the Executive Director at Federal Bank, joins us now on the show. Harsh, thanks a lot for joining in and uh, appreciate uh, you know, your time here. Wanted to start by asking you, post this fundraising, 
uh, what would the cost of funds be in the near term? Would this help in controlling cost of funds? And what's the outlook? Good morning, Tony, and thanks for inviting us to the show. Yeah, the, the two parts. One is the cost of deposits, which we have seen increasing trends across the banking industry. But largely, we have seen that getting priced in. So the last quarter probably saw the tail end, the fag end of the pricing and of the high cost of deposits. We are raising about 4,000 odd crores, between 3,000 crores for QIP and another 1,000 crores, 958 crores to be precise, for the uh, preferential allotment. This will definitely help us in bringing down the cost of funds. But this is the cost of deposits still has plateaued out, seems to have plateaued out now. Okay. Uh, that will help you in bringing down the cost of funds. Got that. I want to talk a little bit about the overall business. Uh, you know, there is this expectation that loan growth for you will be in this range of around 18 to 20 percent. It's something that you folks have spoken about in the past as well. But just trying to understand where is the maximum traction coming in from, uh, you know, whether it's from corporate, retail, agri. Uh, where are you seeing maximum demand? And this 18 to 20 percent is something that you can hold on to in FY24. And what's the outlook for FY25? Yeah, we are quite, we've been guiding the markets that we've been looking at growing at 80 to 20 percent growth, and we don't see a challenge over there. Both the rural demand and the urban demand have been quite fairly robust. Between corporate and both, uh, retail, both sides we have been growing on average between 90 to 21 percent is what we have seen. The quarter and quarter performance in the year on year growth has been on those lines. Uh, in the wholesale side, we are seeing a fairly robust growth. We are seeing capacity utilizations increasing. And there's a demand coming in, whether the telecom, the renewable energy space, or the data centers, the real estate, it's all signs of showing up pickup. On the retail side, the consumer demand remains robust. While the industry is guiding at 14 15% growth, we expect to grow at least 4 to 5% higher than the industry growth. So 18 to 20% is something which we are fairly confident about achieving. Okay, all right. Hi, Harsh. Uh, good morning, Nigel, on this side, and congratulations on your new role. Well, just go putting in that basic math of 80 to 20 percent for the next few years. Your current loan book size, I think, is around 1.8 lakh crore rod. That should potentially double, I think, in the next by around 2027 or thereabouts. But I just want to focus on a couple of aspects of your loan book. You know, your credit cards, your microfinance, commercial vehicles, personal loan. I think as of now, it's just around 8,000 on a base of around 1.8 lakh crore. And there is a lot of traction out here. You know, from around 5 percent of your book, what do you expect the contribution to go to? Okay, on an increasing book, we are looking at a share of roughly about 10% being contributed by the high margin businesses. Commercial vehicle, microfinance, credit cards, gold, and the MSME piece remain our clear focus areas. At this point in time, the, uh, uh, the same. MFI piece, the credit cards, and the commercial vehicle piece is about, as you rightly mentioned, about 7,000 crores. But broadly speaking, that's a segments which are growing at 60 to 70 percent right now, partly because of the lower base and also partly because of the fact that we see a high opportunities over here. To give you an example, the microfinance we were disbursing last year about 50 to 60 crores per month. Now we are averaging at over 200 crores a month. Similarly, for commercial vehicle, we've expanded our geographical footprint and covering Pan India now and leveraging on the branch network and the DSA network. And again, over there, our disbursements per month has more than doubled. Similarly, on credit cards, we are at 2,000 crores plus in terms of size right now, but we are growing at about 50% or a little bit on a smaller base, but significantly higher. So we expect as a part of our total book to touch about close to 10%. Okay. All right. Harsh, just uh, on the, a quick question. Okay. Yes. Quick question out here. Your fundraise as well as the way you're changing your mix, you know, your loan mix. Uh, it could help your NIMS. Now, your NIMS for the past quarter were at multi-quarter lows, but you'll have said that it'll recover from year on. So from around this 3.15% odd, what should be the broad range of NIMS for this year? That's FY24. Okay, the NIMS have definitely been under pressure because what typically happens, the repricing on the loan growth typically happens faster. So you saw the NIM expanding really fast and peaking for us in the Q3. And then you saw the deposit piece catching up. So we were at 3.2 in FI22, we were at 3.31 in FI23. And while the Q3, the Q1 of the current year showed the maximum impact of the deposit repricing, we think that this is behind us now. And we are guiding a name of 3.3 to 3.35 for the current okay. financial year. Just and we expect seven to eight basis points uptick in the next quarter and onwards in the name itself, because we see one, the deposit repricing has already happened. 
are impact of the high margin businesses playing in. We are seeing substantial traction over there. The other area which you're focusing on is obviously on the CASA side. We so did see a fall, but you're looking at re recouping that, especially the car piece. So all these put together, we are reasonably confident of achieving a 3.3 to 3.35 name which we've been guiding. Okay, 3.3 to 3.35, you said. Uh, you know, you yes. were talking about how a couple of your businesses are picking up quite a bit, whether it's the CV business, the MFI business, um, and this is in high teens, the growth that you're seeing. What would this mean for slippages? Now, I know it's a, I mean, it's just a, a, a niggling worry, slightly higher slippages compared to what you did last time around at about 490 crores. And your slippage ratio, though, is still around 1.09%. But do you see any incremental pressure on slippages? What could the run rate be uh, going forward? No, we are still guiding at the same levels. We do not see any deterioration in the asset quality materially at all. 40, 45 basis points is what we've been guiding for. And uh, last year, Touchwood had been at a significantly uh, better asset quality of 41 basis points for the full year. So we are guiding the same levels. We don't see too much of a reduction. We are a reasonably conservative bank. So within those risk parameters, and obviously the situation is dynamic, so we have focusing on the high margin businesses, but reasonably risks boxed in. So we do not see the slippages going materially from where we have been guiding at. 40, 45 basis points is what we'll be guiding for. Okay, so um, you don't see a material deterioration in asset quality, and that's always a good no, thing. On the restructured book, your current restructured book uh, stands at about 3,400 crores. Any update on that? How much of your book can go bad? In, uh, I'm assuming not much, but if you can just give us the numbers. The restructured book did face a little bit higher slippages than obviously the normal book, but we have seen the checks on that part. We do not see any material disruption on that book either. The full impact of it will play out during the current financial year when the pains start coming in. But however, we do not see much of a challenge on our uh, restructured book on the retail side either. Okay, all right, Harsh, a final question before we let you go. You know, you'll have a couple of uh, companies that are part of the group, you know, which you could be looking at unlocking some value, insurance arms and the likes. Uh, is there some kind of uh, unlocking of value you could see in this year itself, in the current uh, financial year? No, no, nothing. On we are, which is there in the domain, we are looking at an uh, issue coming up for the our subsidiary FedFina, which is there on the domain, public domain. As, at this point of time, we are not looking at monetizing our insurance piece at this point in time. So we are staying invested. FedFina happens this year itself? Pardon? FedFina? Uh, you know, you are looking Fed at some fundraise, right? Yeah. This is an IPO coming in. We are filed for the DRHP. So we are looking at a fundraise at the FedFina level. Barring that, there's right. no other plans to raise any further investments. Okay, okay. Uh, one final question then from Aaron Harsh. Uh, since you've just taken on the mantle of executive director, and you know you have experience across several sectors, right, within banking, whether it's uh, you know corporate, commercial banking, wholesale, etc. For the next two to three years, what is the longer-term vision of Federal Bank? I mean, what is the what will the focus area be? Uh, whether it is on the digital side, whether it is in you know commercial banking, retail, uh, what have you set your sights to do over the next two to three years? Okay, there are quite a few exciting areas. On the fintech space, as you are aware, we are one of the banks with the maximum number of partnerships, both on the marketing side as well on the cost processes side as well. We continue to remain absolutely engaged with most of our fintech partners. In fact, we are the go-to bank for most of our fintech partners. So that's one area which we are because we realize that we, while we go the physical aspects with the branch network at 1370 or branches, we're looking at expanding our, our physical footprint as well. But our partnerships and especially our digital partners is something where we are clearly focusing on. So that's one area. In terms of businesses, which we already discussed, commercial vehicle, microfinance, cards, gold will remain a thrust area. They are a smaller base, but their share in the business is going to grow materially. And this sector-wise, also, we see a huge opportunity over here. Coming to the micro, uh, MSME piece, we are largely a mid-market bank. Uh, between our commercial banking and business banking, we have about 33,000 odd crores as a book size. We are looking to grow that book materially more at 20% plus levels in the next near to medium term over here. So the clear focus areas would be on the tech and the digital partnership. 
Three or second is the high margin areas which we are looking at at that point in time. Cost to income is another thing which we hopefully expect to pay taper off. The last piece which we are focusing on is on the CASA piece. We are at a 30% or in terms of a CASA mix. We are looking at how we can raise that materially by becoming a payments and collection bank. And that is something which we are rolling out a complete digital platform for the corporates which we are revamping it, which we take care of collections, payments, trade, <clears throat> supply chain. Uh, supply chain is another area which I missed out, is an area which we are clearly focusing on, which gives a higher risk adjusted yields to the bank. So these are the clear focus areas for the next two to three years. I do see the banking in general to be fairly exciting and more particularly I think Federal Bank is reasonably well placed in the sector to leverage on that. Okay. All right. Well, Harsh, valuations as well are in your favor. Thanks so much uh, for joining in and uh, you know, giving us the outlook that you have for the bank and all the best in this new role. We look forward to chatting up with you rather soon. So those are the big uh, highlights coming in from Federal Bank, looking at doubling their book in the next four years or so. NIMS will be in the vicinity of around 33 to 3.4%. And also asset quality will improve. Don't see any big risk on that front. For the time being, though, we'll slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Mr. Jaya Sankar of Kotak Investment Banking. We'll talk about the heavy promoter selling across the market. Later on in our special segment, Charting Trends, Rahul Sharma of GM Financial Services will help us decode the charts and technical trends. Don't go anywhere. Okay, welcome back. Uh, 40 points on the Nifty. We are uh, actually looking better and better compared to where we started at 9.15. So, definite improvement all around. Now, the Mothira Losal Conference, of course, in Mumbai is underway. Uh, and uh, we had Ramdeo join us yesterday, the uh, chairman and MD, joint MD at Mothira Losal, who told us that one of the things he's noticing is that uh, more and more uh, foreign investors from different geographies, not just the traditional London, Singapore, US kind of geographies, but other newer geographies are also registering and showing interest uh, here in India. Uh, so my colleague uh, Nimesh actually caught up with one such uh, investor. Uh, he caught up with uh, two gentlemen, uh, Fujimura Tariharu, the chief investment officer at Asian Investment, uh, the CIO of the Asian Investment Division, uh, and uh, Paul Simon, deputy head of the Asian Investment Division of Sparks AMC. Uh, now, uh, he began by asking them about the outlook for uh, global as well as Indian markets from here on. Listen in. I believe the, in the past, U.S. market or Chinese market led the, the worldwide stock market. But I believe now Japan is booming. But the, after Japan, I believe Asian equities time is coming. And especially India, maybe the very attractive market, I believe. Sure. Uh, you spoke about India being an attractive market. Yeah. What's making you bullish on India? What are the ground level changes that you see, which is making an investment case for an for investment manager like you? I think one simple idea is demography. Still, India is a very attractive country as a growing population. And the second point is global changes. You know. China used to be a worldwide biggest factory, and the U.S. raised the consumption, but now the world is fragmented, and the, and the market demand is changing now. So I think India is very attractive in terms of supply chain shift or adapting to the variety of demand, I think, for the investors. Uh, Paul, uh, thanks for joining me uh, and uh, pleasure having you at the, at the conference as well. Uh, you manage the India portfolio, right? Uh, how do you construct the India portfolio sitting out of, out of, out of India? And what are, the, what are the benefits or what are the opportunities that you see when you're constructing the India portfolio? Thank you. I too am based in Tokyo, Japan. So we manage an India fund based out of Japan. And when we look at investing in Indian companies, there are two criteria. The company needs to grow at roughly 50% higher than Indian GDP. 
and the company needs to generate excess returns on capital of roughly around 5%. That's how we look at companies in general. And we, because of our legacy, Sparks is a legacy small cap firm. We focus in mid small caps in Japan, though we do multi strategy today. The India Fund is also focused on mid small cap, and that's where we think we can add a differentiator as a long term patient investor. Sure. Uh, you know, briefly, when I was when I was having a word with you, you said large p part of your investments is in the financials, whether it's uh, banks or maybe insurance companies as well. Take us through your your way of constructing the India portfolio and why you like financials in India. So, bulk of our portfolio is in financials. So, there are two aspects. How we look at financials is in two aspects. One, there is credit based and non credit. It is safe to say that there is no Indian growth story without a credit growth story. So, it's quite that part is quite obvious. What we think is more attractive is the non-credit part of it, whether it's insurance, whether it's asset management, whether it's brokerage, or the infrastructure plays like the data companies or the exchanges in India. So there are multi, multiple themes uh, on the financial space, and credit will be the bulk of our portfolio. And there, I think the biggest play is the big banks, which are the which meet both our criteria. And we also find specific niche plays, whether it's in affordable housing, whether it's in gold finance, etc. Sure. Uh, I'll come to you on, on the India part, but Fujimara, uh, from, a, from a global perspective, how do you look at China and are you even uh, seeing a trend of a lot of money moving out of Chinese equities into the Indian equities? I think now the worldwide money is coming out from China sure. and they're going to Japan or India or other Southeast Asian countries, I believe. Of course, depend on the variation, China may be the opportunity to invest in, but in the long term, not China, not Japan, India or other Asian countries may be more attractive, I think, because of the growth. So uh, I understand uh, you never used to travel too much to India, but now you're, you're, you've You've increased your travel and you want to come more and more into Indian market. So what are the, what are the sectors or what are the companies that you're, you're finding attractive in the Indian market? I think as Paul mentioned, yeah. I, used, I have been a Japanese small cap fund managers yeah. and the Indian market is same as Japanese small cap market. Broad universe and not covered and huge growth potentials. So I believe not, not any industries in the Mindan small caps, uh, there are many good companies, I believe. So I rely on Paul sure. to uncover new attractive small caps in the right. Indian market. Right. Uh, Paul, uh, I understand you have a large exposure in the financials, the, the, the banking space, but I believe you don't have any exposure to either IT or pharma names. And especially pharma has done well in the last six, eight months. So what's your view on, on, uh, on pharma? And do you think there is a bit of a miss out feeling that the fact that you don't have any pharma stocks in your portfolio? Well, it would not be fair to say that we have no pharma exposure. Okay. We don't have any pharma export exposure. Okay. So we have domestic, domestic uh, formulations uh, yeah. plays. But on the export side, we don't see that as being an India growth story. And I think there are way too many variables, whether it is with FDA inspections or whether it's with... Uh, uh, product approval cycles, etc. So we think that it's too complex a name for us, and for us as generalist investors, uh, we feel that a consumption-driven domestic formulations plays a much uh, easier story for us. Sure. Uh, you know, the one big theme uh, in the last two, three years in India has been the big outperformance of the mid-cap and small-cap. Even in Japan, you would have seen, uh, you would have done some experiences on the mid-cap, small-cap in, in Japan as well. Uh, what are the similarities? And B, are you getting a lot of opportunities to invest in the mid-cap and small-cap space in India? Yeah, so we think it's, for us it's two reasons, right? For us being based in Japan, we think that the large-cap market is covered by excellent managers in India and also abroad. And we think for us the differentiator is to take a longer-term view because we, we believe that in a way that we've time-traveled. In Japan, we've seen a lot of these themes play out, whether it's in industrials, consumptions, basic materials, etc. And we're trying to bring that intelligence and see how we can predict how things will play out in India over the next 10 years. And across sectors, we see multiple opportunities. And we could say that markets have rallied quite a bit in the mid-cap space, but also we need to look at where they were in the start, where they're sufficiently valued, and what is the growth potential. So relatively speaking, we still think there's a lot of opportunity in the mid-small cap space. Okay. What, could be, what could be the key triggers that you'll be watching out for for further increasing the India exposure? Yeah, so in the space where we are, 
I think liquidity drives a lot of the pricing, especially in the mid-small cap space. So we'd like to let a little bit of the hot money get out. And then uh, when valuations correct a bit, not that we think on absolute levels they're expensive, but from a liquidity-driven perspective, we think uh, movements could be very volatile. So we're waiting for, let's say, slightly better valuation In conditions. Yeah. All right. Interesting uh, conversation there. Bullish on the uh, India portfolio, particularly financial. So interesting commentary coming out there. But let's shift focus then to some market trends now. now. In 2023 so far, promoters have sold close to around $10 billion dollars. You know, that's uh, in this calendar year so far, and we still have four months to go. Now, that compares with close to around, you know, half that amount in the past year. Last week as well, there was big promoter selling in the likes of Adani Power, JSW Energy, and Interglobe Aviation. To discuss more about these trends, well, we're joined by Mr. V. Jayashankar, uh, the Managing Director and Member of uh, the Board at Kotak Investment. Uh, hi, sir. Morning. Thanks so much uh, for joining in. Well, two ways of looking at it, right? Uh, one would be, hey, the promoters are selling big time. The other way would be, look at the depth in the Indian markets. You have $10 billion of sale from the promoter entities. And yet, in fact, it's all being absorbed and lapped up pretty easily that way. Oh, what's your comment on this? Which side are you leaning towards? So I would uh, put it this way. Uh, you know, the domestic flows have been very strong over the last couple of years between the mutual funds and insurance companies. In each of the last two fiscals, that's 22 and 23, you have had about nearly $30 billion of money come in. Right. And uh, the FPA flows in the current year have been positive of about 19 billion, while it's been negative in the previous two years. So, so when you look at the domestic and foreign flows being equally positive, between them, probably in the current year, uh, uh, FPA flows about 19 billion, domestic flows must be uh, 10 plus billion. So, you have had about 30 billion dollars of money coming into the market, all because of the India growth factor being recognized globally. And also investors in the Indian market, the domestic investors making uh, not only really good money, but also being very sensible about long-term investment through SIPs. So I would say it's driven primarily by a great deal of stability in the current year between both the domestic and the foreign flows. For the first time in the last three years, both are positive and uh, quite attractive. And obviously, when you have these kind of flows, you need more paper. Otherwise, you obviously, obviously will have an asset bubble. And I think it's in this context, you should see a $10 billion of uh, blocks. You'll also see about $10 billion of IPOs, maybe another 3 to $5 billion of follow-on. And to have this kind of a pipeline and, and a deal flow of about, call it $20, $25 billion, is very healthy to absorb, call it $20, $25 billion of fresh flow. I would put it uh, as the flows. The second factor I would say is the blocks have been quite prevalent, I would say, in the last two years. Even when the markets were down last year, we had in the last calendar year something like uh, seven to eight billion dollars of blocks. For example, you had Max Healthcare, uh, KKR sell down two billion dollars uh, in the previous year. Uh, similarly, you had others uh, really taking out some money, both private equity investors as well as promoters. So the monetization of blocks has probably heightened the current year, but it was quite prevalent and prominent in the last year. And I think the blocks business will continue to see a good momentum for the next couple of years. Mm. Hi, Jay Shankar, uh, and you were involved in that Max uh, transaction as well, uh, Prashant here. No, so, uh, yeah, flows, is, you explained it very well. But on the other uh, side, uh, which is the fact that these are early investors and uh, promoters themselves who are uh, selling, uh, what, what does that tell you? I mean, is there a signal to take? Even if it is very broad signal and can't kind of uh, very specifically pinpoint and say that, well, this is what it exactly means. But is there a broad signal we can take about where they think valuations are, uh, vis a -vis where they see opportunity, at least in the medium term? Uh, Prashant, not necessary. I will tell you why. Uh, you know, you should look at the block pipeline more in the context of how active the primary markets have been in the last three years. So if you look at post-COVID, uh, we had a number of issuances over the last three years, in particular in the calendar year 21. And you're seeing the private equity investors and promoters in those situations kind of monetizing. And to give you an example, uh, for MPS compliance, Loda had to do 7,500 crores of QIP over two transactions. Uh, uh, also, we had Manyavar uh, doing a block of about 3,000 crore just a few months back. So... MPS compliance forces a lot of promoters sometimes to, to really monetize and create the 25% uh, minimum public float. 
In other instances, private equity investors who are uh, holding significant minority stakes in companies, uh, whether it's in Medanta, whether it's in Kim's Hospital, whether it's in Sona Comstar, you would see a number of issuances that have happened, 100 odd issuances in the last three years. There are private equity investors sitting with fairly large stakes. So it's only natural that you would see a fairly good block pipeline. The, the, the one thing that I would probably uh, kind of highlight is in the current year, you have had more of the small cap and mid cap IPOs happening. So therefore, you will not see large blocks from the vintage of calendar 23, unlike 21 and 22, when you had large IPOs hitting the market. So it's also a, a function of what kind of size, what kind of market cap uh, companies are when they hit the uh, capital market. And I would say whatever blocks you've seen last year and this year is because of uh, tech companies going public. For example, the digital tech companies probably have contributed more than one and a half billion dollars of flows right in the secondary market in the last uh, six to nine months ever since they came out of lockup. You're seeing a lot of hospital companies getting listed, a lot of hospital companies, both the promoters and private equity investors, creating that NPS requirement. Yes, and and, and could, it is across multiple sectors. Sure, sure. Uh, Jay Shankar, just one final question from my end. This is Sonia here. I get your point that it's very case by case and uh, and all of that. But if you look at the the, the number, right? I mean, 80,000 crores of selling by promoters this year in FY23 is far higher than what we've seen in the last five, six years on an average. And generally, insider selling is considered to be uh, a sort of a red flag, for, at least for shareholders, investors, stakeholders. Is that the right way to look at it? Should investors be concerned with the kind of promoter selling spree that we're having? So they are not at all, and I'll tell you why. I mean, if you look at Interglobe, for example, uh, one of the promoters is selling out of a very planned exercise, uh, which is which is quite public, right? Uh, if you look at Mahindra CIE, Mahindra has exited CIE. It was a, uh, a a good partnership between Mahindra and CIE that lasted several years. And now it's no longer a strategic uh, uh, position for Mahindra, so they have exited. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Maniawar or Loda that did uh, listings where, where the promoters either did a primary or secondary block to create the NPS compliance. It's more to do with civil uh, compliance. So I think it's all driven by either a P investor wanting an exit over a three to five year period, which is fair because the normal period for a P investor is three to five years. And if the markets are at its uh, 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 robustness, why not? And that's the right time to, to kind of sell because the outlook is also pretty exciting for the incoming investors. And, and therefore, both for the exiting investor as well as the incoming public market investors, it holds a promise. Uh, and, and as far as promoters are concerned, you have to look at the context. And in India, with promoters getting comfortable about uh, giving up control, or when there are multiple promoters, one of the promoters continue to be the surviving entity, I think it's very, very uh, likely that you'll see more of these transactions. So I think you should take it as a trend. And when the markets are robust, that's the right time for for any blockchain. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, for uh, stopping by and uh, giving us your comment. You know, when I put out this piece, the question that we were asking is, who's getting it right? Promoters or investors? Well, as you're clearly telling us, there's no need to worry from an investor perspective. This is part of the trend. Some money being taken off the table. Maybe, in fact, it's, uh, as of now, no need to really worry. But, uh, Sonia, you want to take uh, the next segment ahead? Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, this is important, right, from an investor and a viewer standpoint as well. When you see such large promoter selling, you sort of get rattled. But uh, experts telling us that no cause of worry here. Uh, but let's get back to the markets and understand some charting trends now. Rahul Sharma, the director and head technicals and derivatives at GM Financial Services is with us. So let's get to him. Uh, Rahul, thanks a lot for joining in. I want to understand from you what's happening on the headline index because this has been a slightly painful, a slightly frustrating period for investors where the market has been in this really tight range. Do you think this consolidation phase is something that can continue over the next couple of weeks? And if yes, will all the action be in the broader markets now? Good morning, uh, Sonia. So uh, clearly, uh, in the last uh, uh, three, four weeks, we've seen a downward grind in the markets. Uh, this is the first time since COVID we've had four negative weekly closes uh, on the Nifty. Uh, the breakdown was becoming a consensus trade, which is exactly why uh, we're seeing a bounce back happening uh, from 19 to 50 odd levels. 
Now, uh, two uh, forces at play here. One is you have a broader market which is not ready to give up. You have the mid cap and the small cap indices continuing to do well. The broader market participation has not waned out. So on the second side, you have the uh, aggression on the short side, especially from the FIs has not uh, gone up in the previous week. So in spite of the Nifty heading towards the 250 mark, we've not seen additional shorting uh, in any way whatsoever from the uh, institutional part, which is also the reason why uh, we're seeing a bounce back happening. Now, in the very short term, I think once 19,500 is taken out, we should see the current consolidation, the current pullback or time correction ending. And then the Nifty getting back to where it is, which is uh, on the way up, where we feel the 20,000 level should be taken out. And eventually, we should be headed towards 20,800 by the end of this year. So this is a good opportunity to accumulate longs to buy uh, in this correction. We feel the risk reward is still favorable. In case there is some out of volatility, now 19,000 is a very solid base for the Nifty. Uh, maybe around that, around 18,800, one can have a stop loss for long positions. Uh, look to buy in this volatility and we feel there is a good chance that uh, the second leg of the rally moves uh, starts beginning from here. What is also heartening to see is the sectoral rotation that is happening. So we saw banks taking a backseat, IT coming back into flavor and limelight, and we feel this is one sector which should continue to do well. We've seen TSE, uh, the star sector amongst the market, and now we are seeing uh, green shoots in the chemical space as well. So broadly, the markets are shifting, and this is a good and healthy sign that after a correction, we are seeing new, new leaders emerging. All right. Hi, Rahul. Good morning. First of all, congratulations. This fitness mantra has worked out perfectly for you. So good on you, mate. But since we are here to talk about markets, uh, you know, and you're expecting the markets to gradually move towards the 20,000 odd mark. On the Nifty Bank, you know, that one was the leader. It's taken a bit of a break. But what's the trajectory out there? What are the levels you're looking at on the Nifty Bank? Yeah, so uh, Nifty Bank is uh, exactly the area where whatever shorts have been added in the August series have gone. So we started the August series or the expiry of July series somewhere around the 1.3 uh, lakh contracts. Now that has gone up to around 1.5 lakh contracts. Uh, what is happening is uh, Bank Nifty surely has sort of been an underperformer and uh, uh, this would, you know, the, the price performance would continue to be on the languishing side going ahead. So I'm seeing a sectoral shift where we may see banks sort of, you know, not do so well as, uh, uh, as compared to the market. And uh, I think uh, there is a strong case for an IT versus bank uh, switch over here. So we've advised our clients to switch from the banking space and get into IT, which has been a cross underperformer since last 18 odd months. And we feel uh, there is a good bit of alpha to be created uh, from this space. So Bank Nifty continues to uh, sort of, you know, remain under pressure. The short covering hasn't really kicked in. But having said that, I think uh, IT is a better bet as compared between the two. All right. We would have loved to chat some more, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. Thanks a lot, Rahul, for joining us and giving us some trends on the shorting side. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, Manisha Gupta will join in. She'll give us a quick roundup on the commodity market. Stay tuned.
welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Now, since the equity markets are very quiet, we thought let's take a quick look at what's happening in the world of commodities. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, commodities have been under pressure since the US 10-year yield has risen to new highs. But tell us, what's the one commodity you're looking at today? Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, I'm looking at metal as a sector, and we have put behind three weeks of constant declines for most of these metals. And this week hasn't started better with the Treasury yields in US at around 16 month highs. We also are looking at the Chinese numbers not coming in as per expectations. Every data point that you saw come out of July in China was on the weaker side. And then the markets were anticipating a 15 basis point of a rate cut, but we saw 10, and the five year loan rate was not even uh, touched. And then you have weak China imports in sense of metals. The real estate sector demand also has been on the weaker side. For many of the metals right now, we are actually trading on a discount because there is no on-ground demand coming in and the inventories have been rising as well. I'll take the case of copper where the inventories have gained up by 76% since 12th of July. Of course, when you look at a longer period average, we still are on the lower side. But from the lows, we have seen inventories really jump up. Same is the case with nickel where inventories have gained up by 30% in last couple of months. Zinc inventories have gained up by 50% in one month itself. When you look at the zinc production as well, the numbers clearly are on the bearish side here. We have seen zinc inventories, first of all, trade at a 17-month high is there, and the demand has not been so great from the steel or the gadolizing industry, and that has been weighing on. Also, when you look at the demand that has been on the weaker side, the markets are looking at prices that have declined by nearly 24% from 2023 highs, and we are not too far away from the three-year lows that the zinc prices saw in the month of May itself at below $2,200 a ton as well. The markets are looking at the international lead and zinc uh, uh, inventory numbers and that tells you that the global refined production is up by 2.3 percent on a year-on-year basis and when you look at the period from January to May we have seen surplus of around 267,000 tons there. Also when you look at the prices itself in this week we've seen the zinc prices decline by a percentage point and they're down 4 percent in the month of August so far. All right thanks a lot for that. So big crack in commodity prices globally Let's slip into a quick break now. On the other side of the break, our special segment is the economy. Lata will get chatting with Jitanya Kandhari of Morgan Stanley for a money market chat as U.S. yields have reached record highs and how this could impact the India growth outlook. Stay tuned.